the short version. Curing cancer would be a five minute job if you actually had the ability to engineer a virus to do something that you wanted. But do you mean like oh, so there's, perhaps a... There's, there's a chance that this was created in a lab, there's an investigation? A chance? It's not just a little beyond mankind's capability, it's orders of magnitude past it. It's, it's like proposing that we're going to build a lander that's going to land on the sun. What do we do? Oh, you know who we could ask? The Wuhan novel respiratory coronavirus lab. The disease is the same name as the lab. Yeah, just like you get tsunami research centers in places that get tsunamis. So wait a minute, you work at the Wuhan Respiratory Coronavirus Lab. How did this happen? And they're like, mm, a pangolin kissed a turtle. <laughs> and earthquake research centers in places that get earthquakes. Forest fire research is done in places that typically suffer a lot of forest fires. That's just, that's just a little too weird, don't you think? And then they ask those scientists, they're like, how did this... So wait. And yeah, new viruses tend to crop up where species spend time together. And one of the places where that sort of behavior happens is in Wuhan. I mean, this would be kind of like saying that, uh, well, don't you think it's weird that the Florida Research Center for Hurricanes gets hit by hurricanes? Coronavirus lab in Wuhan. Oh, because there's a coronavirus loose in Wuhan. The Florida Research Center for Hurricanes gets hit by hurricanes. Therefore, it's causing hurricanes. How did that happen? Maybe a bat flew into the cloaca of a turkey and... Okay, so let's cut to the core of it. Why is curing cancer easy compared to engineering a virus to actually do something? And for this, I'm going to start off as a conspiracy theorist. I'm going to blow your mind here. The US government is working on trying to genetically engineer a bacteria that will dissolve cellulose. Cellulose, the most abundant biomolecule on the planet. Every plant that stands upright does so because of cellulose. If they release this, it could wipe out all standing plant life on Earth. This would be catastrophic for mankind. This is truly world-ending stuff. I know it's true because I worked on it in a top secret government lab for about a decade. Uh, let me add a slight correction to that. This wasn't a secret lab, it was an open lab with openly stated goals. It was the stated goal of publicly competed for and publicly awarded scientific grants. But if I tell you it's secret, then people will assume that it's something that they don't want you to know. It's a conspiracy. They're trying to hide it from you which is a sort of great way of saying that I didn't have to show you any evidence for it. Now, you might think it's just way too much that people could take publicly available documents like this and turn it into a shady government conspiracy. Except that's what happened several times during the pandemic, with gazillions of people falling for it hook, line, and sinker. I mean, here's just one example from Potholer54, a fellow uh, teenager from the old days who is strongly recommended. A publicly available book that looks at the possibility that a foreign country had weaponized SARS and launched it against China becomes a book discussing weaponizing SARS. And that becomes a document obtained by the US State Department discussing weaponizing SARS. And that becomes a leaked document revealing a sinister plan to unleash coronaviruses. The Australian hyped that further and made it sound as though this was some kind of a secret document. But the real break comes when news.com.au gets hold of the story and replaces the word book with leaked document and substitutes a discussion about the weaponization of SARS with a sinister Chinese plan to weaponize SARS. And that gets copied and passed around the world. Of course, we had broken the big breaking news about how the Chinese military had, of course, planned a biological warfare using the COVID-19 virus. But the thing is, almost everything I told you about the cellulose research is true. Cellulose is the most abundant biomolecule on Earth. And if you could engineer an enzyme in a bacteria to metabolize cellulose quickly, that bacteria would basically destroy all life on Earth. The world ends, the last words man utters are somewhere in a lab. A guy goes, <laughs> it worked. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. 
So why was the US government working on this? Well, basically to turn cellulose into biofuel more effectively. Now, the reason, of course, it was doomed to failure, or almost certainly doomed to failure, wasn't particularly hard to understand. There's been an entire planet full of life for a few hundred million years. And during that time, nothing has ever evolved a way to quickly metabolize cellulose. And the National Renewable Energy Laboratory wasn't just starting with uh, a new attempt at making an enzyme, it was taking these death slow enzymes and trying to make them slightly better. You know, there's a reason why trees take years to rot away in the forest. Turns out the best way to get energy out of cellulose quickly is to um, burn it. And just to put this fully into perspective, so this is what your typical enzyme for dissolving cellulose looks like. This is a crystal structure. And yeah, it looks like a bit of a mess. So we'll go to a different representation where we can see the backbone structure of the protein of the enzyme. And that's your cellulose going through the middle of it. And I'm gonna leave a little bit of uh, the protein structure on there. So all this does, this is a enzyme out of a bacteria, because naturally, and what it does is it takes the cellulose fiber, that's this thing, which is death insoluble, and it very slowly chops off little bits called cellobiose, or little bits of sugar, which are much more soluble and can be metabolized to ethanol much more efficiently. So this is what the whole National Renewable Energy Laboratory was on about, was trying to get a, a better, more efficient way of breaking this single chemical bond here, such that you could more rapidly turn your cellulose into something you could get into a, a form of alcohol more quickly, such that you could make making bioethanol more efficient. All of this was about trying to break a single chemical bond. And this was way beyond the capability of the most powerful nation on earth with the most powerful supercomputers. So how much more complicated than this task that is beyond the capability of mankind is weaponizing a virus? Well, regret to inform, sir, that if we had access to that level of technology, metabolizing cellulose, the thing that is way beyond our current level of ability, would be a five-minute job. And curing cancer would be a problem you could solve by lunchtime. Now, there'll be people out there saying, hang on, but we can actually manipulate the viral DNA or DNA or RNA, right? Well, yeah, but that's like saying you can bang the rocks together, therefore you can shape matter. So anyone who bangs the rocks together can just make SUVs and silicon chips. I mean, that editing of DNA is basically how they were trying to get these better enzymes for metabolizing cellulose. Just because you can manipulate the DNA doesn't mean you can manipulate the outcome. <laughs> Doing it for a single bond would be trivial compared to trying to engineer it for a specific effect in an organism. But let's just put that aside for the second. The whole idea of weaponizing a virus is internally inconsistent. It's, it's just intrinsically stupid. You see, pretty much the first thing that you learn about viruses, if you're studying such things, is they're basically self-replicating cell fragments. And because of this, they evolve. Put simply, you don't have to weaponize viruses. They do it themselves. For free. It's called evolution. Which is why, over history, every now and again, a new virus evolves that will wipe out a significant fraction of the population and those that survive the virus, to other ones that tend to be resistant to it and not die from it. The species that the virus infects also evolves by basically pruning away the portion of the gene pool that isn't resistant to the virus. This was before we found out the little hack called vaccines, which give you some resistance to the virus without the dangers of actually getting infected by the virus. The second thing you learn about viruses is they're almost impossible to eradicate, to the point where there are only two viruses in the entire history of mankind that humans have ever successfully exterminated. One of those was the smallpox virus, which was done by a worldwide mass vaccination campaign. The other was a cow virus that you could get rid of just by killing the cows that were infected and burning them. Yeah, turns out this is a very robust way of getting rid of a virus, is to basically kill anything that's infected with it and burn it. 
Not so many takers for that as a solution when it comes to people. I say we take off and nuke the entire site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Look, there's been life on Earth for some 4 billion years, and over those 4 billion years, cellular life has yet to find a way of successfully stopping viruses. That is, viruses are slippery little bastards. They're incredibly hard to get rid of, the naturally occurring ones. This is before you start worrying about the ones that you might artificially create. So yeah, you can create a new viral DNA. It's just that you don't really have any idea what effect that's going to have on the actual function of the virus. Now, sure, the idea of genetically engineering a new virus that you have the cure for is a great sci-fi plot. Nuclear power is meaningless in a world where a virus can kill an entire population and leave its wealth intact. But fundamentally, it assumes that viral researchers don't know that viruses can evolve. You know, the whole thing becomes a bit of a self-defeating effort in that if you have a virus which you have the cure for, all you're going to do is put a massive pressure on that virus to develop a drug-resistant strain. That is, the only ones that are left are the ones that are resistant to your drugs or your vaccines or whatever you got. Cures or vaccines can become obsolete relatively quickly. So yeah, on the most superficial levels, weaponizing a virus is a self-defeating proposal. The whole thing is predicated on the idea that you're going to get a load of virus engineers that aren't aware of the most rudimentary things about viruses and don't have any problem with engineering something that's going to kill millions of people and can keep that secret perfectly. And even if you could do all of that, you're only one evolutionary mutation away from the virus evading your vaccine and killing your guys as well as the ones you were uh, trying to kill. So what's all the deal with virus research then? Well, there's not a lot to a virus. A bit of viral DNA, RNA, that sort of thing that has got to get inside your cells. And on the outside of the virus is a bunch of proteins, which help it get into your cells and infect them. So the majority of it is trying to actually inhibit those spike proteins and stop them from being able to infect your cells. And this is where you get into the gain of function research, which looks at what mutations are most likely in those spike proteins and tries to assess if those would be more effective or less effective at actually getting into the cell. It's a sort of best guess as what the next likely evolutionary steps for the virus are and if they'll be better or worse at getting into cells. And if the current antibodies will work with the new evolved version of the virus. But this is just a tiny fraction of the virus life cycle. And this is where you've got to keep mankind's ability to manipulate complex systems like life in perspective. Cellular life is a bunch of mind-blowingly convoluted biochemical reactions. So complex that it's small wonders that organisms function at all. Cells form larger systems called organs which have to function in unison with other organs to form an organism, which can in themselves form large groups and have group behaviours, you know, social interactions, that sort of thing. Cancer, just so we're clear, is basically a single biological bug in the cell's self-replication process, which causes lumps to grow in the organs, which eventually get big enough to cause problems, which kill the organism. But fundamentally, it's a single bug in the cell's self-replication process. As such, you would have thought it would be fairly simple to fix. But it turns out, not so much. The biological processes are just way too entangled. Put simply, most of the stuff that will kill cancer will also kill regular cells too. Trying to engineer a virus to actually do something would make curing cancer seem like a cakewalk at amateur hour. Not only do you have to work out how to get past the immune system and get the virus into the body, you then have to get it into the cells, have it self-replicate more viral particles, and you're still nowhere near done. Then you need to be able to interact with those cellular systems to get those virus particles out of the organs, out of the organism, evade any group behaviours that might be implemented to stop the virus transmission, such as social distancing or masks, that sort of thing, and then get that virus into another organism. And then it's got to grow well enough inside the human to actually cause harm, but not so quickly that it kills people quickly, because if people die quickly, the virus can't spread. 
You know, ideally you want people walking around with the virus for a long period of time, infecting lots of other people without actually becoming sick with the virus themselves. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is comically beyond what's technologically possible. And having achieved a gazillion impossible things, you then have to be stupid enough to release it in the belief that this highly infectious, highly deadly virus will only kill your enemies. Now, we know that this virus lab in China was collecting viruses. So is it possible that these wild viruses were brought into contact with humans in the lab? Well, yes. But at that point, calling this a leak is doing some pretty heavy lifting if the virus was collected in the wild in the first place. And likewise, any genetic tinkering that's been done with these things is at best a sort of mildly enhanced evolution because we simply don't have the technology to do anything more sophisticated. Basically, you don't have to weaponize viruses. Mother Nature's been doing it quite happily all by herself for some 4 billion years now. And that's today's dose of scientific reality. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, maybe drop a thumbs up on it. And if you really like the work of this channel, you can support it directly through Patreon. Thanks for watching.